We're just trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? Welcome back to O'Reilly really Radio 149, recorded for a no, Saturday. Saturday, April 1st, 2017, where we dismantle the current events for your edutainment through mostly rational conversations that make you go, oh, really? I'm your host, Andy Cohen, and I've got Daniel Atherton still with me, hanging out through the wee hours of the morning here. So, <clears throat> we, got, uh, we got our good ideas segment. Let's see here. I've got it. Uh, there it is. It's time for another good idea, bad idea. Good idea. Yeah, we'd actually like to make it through a full whole show if we can <laughs> We can actually do it. There's been so much Chug going on. Oh, darn you, Trump. You're ruining my show. Um, but, you know, if you have feedback and things that we have to talk about, things that we need to correct, uh, we're totally open to that because we want to have a rational uh, approach to life and be as correct as possible in everything. Fact-based living, not alt facts. Please, if you find anything that we, that we need to correct, go ahead and send us a note at O'Reilly Radio Podcast at gmail.com. Or phone it in at 470-222-O-R-L-Y. That's 6759. All right, some, uh, some good ideas here. So um, Universal ba- basic, uh, UBI, <laughs> Universal Basic Income, is back in the news. You brought yep. this one over from Futurism. So apparently there's, uh, there's some other evidence that, uh, that oh, UBI might be a good thing. Oh, this article is immense, and I can't thank... Uh, Scott Sentens, uh, who is the, the author of this article, for doing and putting all this together. Um, again, UBI continues to be in, in the news. Uh, going back to our, our science section, our favorite Tony Stark impersonator, um, Elon Musk has come out in favor of UBI, considering just how automated things are moving towards and an automated economy Mm -hmm. so there there is a need for society to be able to continue and ubi is the answer um and here we see a lot of case study uh on powers of perception attribution uh fight or flight within animals and humans even dogs, there have been studies, <laughs> um, as well as putting individuals into a, at quote unquote, paradise conditions. Um, and before, before you get, get too deep, uh, futurism is kind to us, and they put a little in brief here. So yeah. the, the TLDR of it all. The immediate need for basic income in recognition of the effects of chronic stress and the importance of improving environments, eliminating huge stressors like worrying about being able to afford food and shelter, can do wonders for the potential of humanity. That's that's pretty much what we've uh, spoken of before. That's the summary. Yeah. Um, you can, by all means, I, I, I implore you, go out to O'ReillyRadio.com. Uh, Check the show notes for 149, click this article, read it, and you will have a better understanding of the biological argument for UBI. Not just the moral argument, or the ethics argument, or even the economic argument. Mm -hmm. The biological imperative for us as a society and as a species this being a necessity. Yeah. It's I'm I'm still not sure that I even agree with it. And UBI? Yeah, I'm not sure that I do. Mostly because I don't trust humans to deal with it properly. You there know, are going to be people who abuse it. There's going to be people who abuse any form of welfare. No, no, no. It's not the it's not the people that are just living on the welfare. I'm talking about the people that don't treat it in accordance with a holistic approach to an economy. Oh, okay. I see. Because it it would be one of those slippery slope kind of things where, well, we have to improve the basic living stipend in order to do this and this and this. And at what point does the 
basic living, you know, start to absorb all the resources of the of the economy. And you know, the, there are things in human nature that where people will continue to drive for those things. They they want things that are better. And some of those people, in a purely altruistic way, want people to be taken care of as well, and they want that to be better. And that can get into an out-of-control condition where the drive to make everyone's basic condition better actually has the counter-effect of making them not need anything more. Because there has to be, at some level... A need where, yeah, basic isn't enough. If basic goes just a little bit beyond being basic, then you have that motivation problem. And, and now, it's, it's a psychological where... thing. You know, it's economy and psychology, and other people are going to want to help people, and that's going to then create the situation where that is going to be in a constant back and forth, back and forth. There, there's it's, it's there's tough. a legislative solution to your, your problem. And it's a simple one, which I'm going, why haven't we done this anyway? Because um, it's easy to legislate if people actually act with altruism. Um, and the simple thing is, okay... We sort of had it with, you know, the minimum wage. Hmm. If the minimum wage had had been written so that it had to raise with inflation, we wouldn't be nearly in the dire straits that we are right now. In fact, if that were the case, minimum wage would be a little over $20 an hour. Right. If we were adjusting for inflation... From the time that minimum yeah, wage and, was legislated, and I, def- I definitely want to point out, I, I want to bring back because uh, many people, because we have grown up and been in our culture so long with what a dollar means, we yeah. lose track of what inflation means. You know, we we, ha- we oh. have been fortunate enough. To not live through a period where a loaf of bread went from being five cents to five dollars. Yeah. You know, that that kind of thing. However, that loaf of bread that you're getting for two dollars and seventy nine cents, you know, that's if you want the honey wheat, the good stuff. You know. That same loaf of bread was maybe eight cents to your grandparents. So, hell, the, within living memory of yeah. myself, I remember when bread was and and the decent bread was ninety nine cents. Yeah, I can remember that. Yeah, so the dollar doesn't go as far. It's all about purchasing power. So, money ain't what it used to be. You know, I, I'm making roughly what my dad used to make back when. Well, I guess no, he was he was about 10 years older than I was. You know, but in that in that neighborhood, you know, the the middle middle class deal. And yeah. I can't It's not going as far. I can't do the things that he did. He had a a motor home and a boat and a house with a pool on a canal. I mean, <laughs> and my mom didn't work. <laughs> so it was yeah. a single income. So the dollar doesn't go as far as it used to. And it's, it's a cognitive thing that we have a real hard time with this. And because of that, things don't seem to make sense because we don't deal with numbers very well. Numbers are kind of hard for the human brain. We have to be taught how to work them. And when, you, when what you see is two fifty dollars for, for a loaf of bread, and you, d- you don't understand, you know, everything else around that. It's tough to talk about things like a basic universal income, universal basic income, because it does not compute with that kind of mindset. But if you get into an economy situation with this, 
Imagine, if you will, that if this happens and you manage to actually control inflation, the Federal Reserve could actually make it to where things go back down to a level that makes sense. Oh, where, yeah. Where a simple billionaire is simply a multimillionaire, but still has the same buying same potential. Same purchase power. Yeah. yeah. Um, and one, one of the economic arguments for universal basic income, and I've made it a number of times in this show before, is it puts a basement on your economy. And what I mean by that is, as, as any economist will discuss with you, and as we've discussed before, those who have the least amount of income spend the most of their income. Right. When you are living paycheck to paycheck, you are spending all of that paycheck. That is going into the economy. That is a driving force. With universal basic income... You are shoring up the basic driving force. You are yeah. regulating it and ensuring it does not drop below a specific point. And, and also, really, uh, from an economy standpoint, that money is purely liquid. Yeah. From a liquidity standpoint, those are the basic living costs. They are going to be spent immediately. That is the hand-to-mouth economy. So a, a basic income like that immediately goes back into circulation. Yeah. It so it drives keeps, it your keeps economy. the economy moving. And it means that should you have any sort of economic bubble burst, it can't get worse than this because you still have those driving forces. Mm -hmm. Businesses stay open because they are still serving those with the universal basic income. Yes. It means that when you have a bubble burst, instead of it affecting the whole of your economy, it only affects sections. It's a bulwark. It's a bulkhead. That's what universal basic income is on mm -hmm. the economic scale. I'm not even talking about the ethical or emotional impact. I'm not even talking about the biological impact, which we, we have here in this beautiful article. Mm -hmm. I'm talking just the economic impact. It ensures your economy. And I think that's a wonderful solution. Because it makes it so that in our global shared economy, if we move towards UBI, we don't have the crashes that we've had in the past. It doesn't get that bad. Yeah. But it is and, a paradigm shift, and it would require... Yes, it is. And it would require an education system that would support a, a basic understanding of mathematics and a basic understanding of economics and how that works, so that that yeah. way people could be comfortable with it. Well, there's that, but also... It, one people, of the things are, that, people are bad at money. Yeah, a lot of people are bad at money. But in order to get even this legislative, you have to have folks across the aisle have this made palpable. And one of the things that I can I can talk to Republicans across the aisle and go, many of you do not like entitlements. Many of you do not like welfare. I say to you, instead of having... Uh, you also hate big government. With a fiery passion. Here's a solution. You can take a number of entitlements. A, a number of, of, of government agencies. From local to federal. And you can consolidate down to UBI. Mm -hmm. It's a consolidation. Yeah. If you're making sure that you are actually being able to pay for food, pay for a roof over people's heads, that that takes pressure off of HUD 
and a number of other services and rolls them into one program. Absolutely. Yeah. Also, you love tax credits, right? Oh, yeah. Tax credits are awesome. Yeah, yeah. They're the best. So Sorry, I play a very he, bad Republican. <laughs> here, here's, here's why I put to you. Universal basic income. Everybody gets this. Including even your well-to-do. Yeah. If you don't touch it, there's a tax break. You didn't touch the money. Oh, I see where you're going with that. Okay, so for the, for the rich... That universal basic income is a write-off. Becomes a tax credit. Yeah. Hmm. It's not a giant one, and it's not yeah. sliding scale. It, it's a flat tax credit. Yeah. It also means when you are transitioning. Oh, okay, okay, up. okay. So I, I can see how that would work, um, even as, you know a middle-class person that wouldn't need it, they could also yeah. get that tax credit. Or if you only needed part of it. Mm -hmm. If you only needed part of it, you're only taxed on on the part that you, you used. And if you used all of it, well, obviously you needed it, or you used a certain amount, you obviously needed it. So yeah. that doesn't get taxed. It's only if you use a part of it that there is a tax on it. And even that is on a sliding scale. Hmm. Pretty much, hi, did you use... If you used less than 50% of, of, of your UBI, okay. there is a small tax. So as you pull yourself up, as you pull yourself out, you're getting more and more of a tax credit. Okay, okay. So within the tax credit, which is definitely something that that Republicans can agree on, and you know, I'm I'm starting to, you know, as you're as you're talking about, I'm starting to warm to the idea here because what you're saying is that based on the tax credit, that's how you create the incentive to yes. bootstrap your way out and yes. not, and simply not need it anymore. And then you have a, a, a constant rebate every year. And an attaboy for not needing the state. Yeah. So basically, at every level, it ends up being a carrot and yes. not a stick. At, Precisely. E at every level. And it's not hard to make it that way. And since you're having this yeah. constant influx, this is your basement. The, 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 this is the groundwork of your economy. Hmm. You, and if you incentivize it in, in, in just a smart way, it can be self-sustaining. Also, hi, Social Security. If you've got UBI, you can get rid of that. Yeah, just roll it in. Yeah. and if That's you, an entire department gone. Yeah, and, and if you do... If you treat it properly, and then you create a 401k system, a retirement plan, if you're putting money into the retirement plan, you get more tax credits. Because it's you, are, you, you are making sure... PBI. Yeah, you are making sure that you are going to take care of yourself later in life. So that you are not a burden to the state. Yeah. So it's you the, it, incentivize it, that as well. And on top of that, if you just make it so that UBI, if you legislate it, that it is always adjusted for inflation mm -hmm. and make sure that the inflationary adjustment period is in line with a reasonable interval. And I would say reasonable interval is every five years it is adjusted. Yeah, as opposed to like, it, yeah, half the census rate. Yeah. Of course, I really think the census census ought to be done more frequently as well. 
it, it's just such a large undertaking that yeah. that's why it's 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 oh, done so slowly. Speaking speaking of the census, real quick, um, I found out that they are doing it digitally this uh, this time around, which is great. So it helps relieve some of that burden. It's for the first time ever. They're actually going to have an online census where you can fill out your stuff online. And that is going to be an enormous saver. Of course, they're, if they could get the right forms and not hurt people, you know. Yeah. But, no, if you have it at a, a proper interval where it always adjusts to inflation, then you don't have to worry about passing laws to increase it later. Mm -hmm. You're not having this giant knockdown, drag out fight through Congress. And it makes sure that your economy is shored up. Plus, you have the, the, the moral, biological, intellectual imperatives of this. UBI frees people up to pursue the things that they are talented at and desire to do. Yeah, that, there's have already so many, so many reasons have, to have it. We have already seen in studies that those who are actually benefiting from UBI, uh, a good number of them, end up still working, but it's usually a part-time job, and a lot of times, mm -hmm. it people end up volunteering more. Yeah. You have people who want to actually and have the luxury of the time to engage with their communities. You know, the, the, the ideal 1960s of, you know, the community and throwing block parties and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. People don't do that anymore. And there's a reason for it, and it's an economic one. Yeah, Absolutely. We're too busy doing everything else just to live. We've truly fallen right into the rat race that, you know, was one of those things that was always so lauded as being terrible and uh, something to be avoided, especially by the, uh, in the 1960s. No, you, you take those societal and economic pressures off the human animal, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden they can achieve what they can achieve, do what they want to do. Think of all the economic drive yeah. progress we could make, all those minds that would be freed up to pursue not just, you know, the, the typical dreams of the arts, which, again, we can get into an entire societal debate about the arts later. Yeah. But not for this show. <laughs> you could have people who are pursuing education. You can have people who are pursuing sciences, innovations. We don't have a lot of people who pure invent research. much anymore. Yeah, pure research, the backyard tinkerer, you know, yeah. the basement inventor. Think about all the wonderful things that we have gotten through somebody who was essentially a tinkerer. Mm -hmm. A lot of our scientific progress with in the 20th century and the 19th century was done by people who had the time to, to think. test stuff. To think. And to think. Yeah. Albert Einstein. He was a patent clerk, but he was not always a patent clerk. Once he actually got a couple things out, he, he sat at a university. Like and a thought. lot of sitting. He hadn't. He was given an office. He was given a house. He was given a salary to think. Hell, Niels Bohr and Heisenberg, mm -hmm. guys who did thought experiments, talk them out. Yeah. These are how. These are the ways that we get innovation. I mean, we've heard stories that with with our Tony Stark, it has been a lot of his ideas have come from just talking out with friends and family and yeah. having the luxury to do that and having the resources at his fingertips to make it a possibility. To pursue a goal. To seek a dream, to see if it could be made real. And so many brilliant minds are being shackled 
uh, economic pressures. Mm -hmm. Think of how much further we could be as a society, as a, a species, if we weren't shackled to just basic survival. Yeah, there are a few other things that, that would need to be added into there for this to work. Yes, but this but this is the step. Yeah. And it needs to be it needs to be pressed and it needs to be kept being brought up not just by the few but by the many. Well, you know, you've you've really um you've illuminated a few things that I hadn't thought about with it and and that has put me into a different mindset about it. And and honestly, I think that's where a lot of people sit. They simply don't understand the the sum total of it all and it's hard to even think about because they don't have the time to think you know because there's there's so many other things weighing them down and a lot of it is financial and to and to think that that burden that they are possibly mastering they're doing very well with it and they're very proud of themselves for doing so and then to to say, what if we just gave everybody enough money to live? That takes their pride away from them. Emotionally, it is damaging to them. That's the problem. That's the tough sell. I can spin it so it's not the tough sell. The problem is the emotional knee-jerk. We Okay. It's, it's a long-term approach. You got, it, this is the mountain that has to be worn down by the stream. Here, here's a quick question I can put to anybody, and I can pretty much get this, the same answer. You want better for your kids, right? Of course. Okay. You realize you're not going to always be there, right? Sad but true. Okay. I put it to you. The universal basic income makes certain that regardless of the winds of fate and chance, your child and your grandchildren will be taken care of. Don't you want that? But by the state. I want them to be free. The state exists so that society, which is made up of your kids, our kids, their grandkids... Are taken care of. Something happens. Your kid. Did they play sports? Absolutely. Yeah. Little Johnny's great at baseball. Okay. Johnny gets. He's really great at baseball. Gets a scholarship to any number of universities. Play on the field. He's trying to make the play. He's playing in the outfield. He makes that leap. Impacts the wall. Spine is compressed. There is pressure uh, on his spinal cord. And all of a sudden, Johnny medically can't really do much. Disability covers practically nothing for living expenses nowadays. He will suffer. It is because of that possible doomsday scenario that universal basic income is a necessity. Not, that, not pie in the sky. It's a necessity. That might work. That might work. It's for your kids. It's for your grandkids. In case something happens. Terrorist attack. Natural disaster. Economy collapse. If they went off to war, they became happened. disabled, they came home, nothing was there to take care of them. Yeah. That might work. I don't know. But this is definitely something that's going to keep coming up, and, uh, and I think that we've, we've had a good discussion on it this evening. So, let's table it for now, because it'll be back. Oh, yeah. So and definitely, does, uh, definitely, I'll be folks, there. Folks, uh, you know... For those following along at home, if we haven't bored you to death, um, though I, I felt like really we should have had like a, a you know a small small plate with a, with cheese and crackers and a bottle of port wine and some cigars and just like sitting on a porch, just 
talking over this. You know, the way Elon does with, with other people. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that's really one of the driving factors and and forces behind this idea. Yeah, it's just sometimes you just got to think about it. And, you know, what what would be the most fulfilling thing to you? And, you know, those are the things that you have to have to reach into. You got to reach into that bag of of want and think about how to get it. And okay, so what would you do if you had all the time in the world to do it? And you didn't have to worry about money and, and making those ends meet. Well, I'd probably study a lot more. I'd probably read a lot more. I'd probably go back to school. But if those ends meeting necessitated that I couldn't go to school because school was too expensive, then school has to be free too. So education has to be free. So we also have to have free universal education. If the universal basic income doesn't handle things like health coverage, then we also have to have universal health care. So, from a society, if we had universal basic income, universal health care, and free education, free higher education, okay? Yeah. The sky's the limit for what we could achieve. Especially if, as, as we laid out there, the tax incentives to go beyond and get off the universal income and be your own person and become a billionaire. You can do it in that situation, and there is room and incentive to do so. Oh, yeah. That's and, the thing and it's, That's the thing that the Republicans are afraid of, that you're taking away all the incentive to achieve. No. But by all means, I know. with just a simple adjustment to the tax code, right. you can make this possible. Yeah. It wouldn't even have to be huge. This is the kind of it, thing that, that could be could be done flatly. It really it, could. It's an, it's an easy legislative yeah. fix. And again, as I said, mm. if you you use less than fifty percent, you are taxed on a sliding scale. Yeah, or or some percentage. You know, that we'd have to talk to actual economists and figure out exactly yeah. what would be necessary in order to keep the system moving, to keep it afloat, and and what that would do, and and there'd be some financial model like and involved with that to create a system that would be feasible and workable, and would still provide those things. And and that's really the thing. People hear universal basic income and there's a knee-jerk reaction that it's going to just be a welfare system for everybody and then welfare means that nobody wants to work. That's what they have been programmed to think. And that is the thing that has to be broken. It is the thinking that a welfare system doesn't let people get out and achieve. I mean, we already know that the, the statistics aren't even there for that. This is just a talking point. But it's the talking point that has to be broken. There are some people that end up on welfare and, and have a real hard time getting off of it. That's true. There are those outliers. But they're outliers. They're anecdotal. Most people who are on food stamps mm-hmm. or on welfare... Especially, yeah. Just, just, just food stamps alone. Yeah. They're usually on it for less than six months. Yeah. It is less than six. It is a social safety net that people fall into and then get back out of. And you know, you guys have done a great job on the on the right. You've you've done a great job stigmatizing it to the point that no one wants to use it. You've done pretty good with that. So, you know, if that was your goal, then kudos. You know, good job. Credit where credit is due. But don't take it away. <laughs> <laughs> because it does still help so many people. So, if we can break that stigma and corre- correct the thinking to a fact-based reality, which seems to be an awful hard thing to do these days, but if well, we can do it, then I think we have some hope. Here, Here's another what argument I can make. And it's fairly easy. You like J.K. Rowling? 
It depends on who you're asking that question to, because some of them think that she's the devil. <laughs> Fair enough. Do you think J.K. Rowling's successful? Well, yes. Okay. The only reason she is successful is because of welfare programs. And Rand died on welfare. She was using them, too. Yeah. I mean, but these things are not things that they ever want to talk about. They have a particular cognitive dissonance about it, and it is just anathema to them. But soon as you frame it within truth, and you frame it to where it's not them, it's not their friends. It has to it's be their them, though. kids. Yeah, yeah. That that's the only thing other than them themselves that would work. I, I always go after kids. I've seen. Some, <laughs> hey, hey. I, uh, I've no, seen some people again, not care about their kids too. For those that don't care yeah. about their kids, I can I can frame it in other ways. But that's a rare. It usually thing. starts Most with people, "Get away from me. You're weird. I don't want to deal with you." <laughs> <laughs> Most people, part it, 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 it's it's the primate brain. It's not the lizard brain. It's the primate brain that I'm appealing to. Mm -hmm. It's the, the the idea of legacy, which is genetically hardwired. If you can make an appeal to legacy, seven out of ten times you'll win. Mm, yeah. That biological drive to continue your your legacy, um, that might work. That might work. But I think we probably need to move on. In fact, we we could just wrap this up and say that this was the universal basic income talk. Yeah. In fact, I think that might be the best thing to do, and just have this as a little time capsule, nice little conversation. Yeah. You know, tell people that you know you, you need to get some cheese and you need to get some wine and you need to just think about this. You know, nice long. You know, give it some thought. Actually. Anyone, if you're listening to this, I don't care if it's, you know, still March. I don't care if it's still April. I don't care when you hear this. If you have an opinion on it, I want to hear it. So contact us over at oreallyradio.com. Drop us a line at the Gmail. Get in touch with us. I want to hear your opinions on this. I want to hear your arguments for and against this. Because mm -hmm. we want to be right. This is a topic that is going to be haunting us mm -hmm. until it's a reality. Yeah, I hope that I've I've presented a lot of the arguments. You know the the stickier points, so that we can knock them down, so that we can yeah. address them, so that we're not ignoring those people, the the naysayers. You know, because that's not a conversation. You have no. to you have to hear out both sides, and you got to talk it through and figure it out. You, know? you have to address the fear. Yeah, and that's the thing. I th I think the most about it is that people are afraid that it's going to to cause the the utter collapse of society, and and that it will run away. You know that they don't understand the the underpinnings of how it works. And how it has to integrate into all these other things in order to be successful and to create a successful society out of it. You know, but if, if we follow what we're talking about here, we could have Star Trek. Yeah. I'm telling you that this is, this this, is kind this of is the Star, Trek, Star Trek, Trek model. Yeah, this is, this is it. You, you educate everybody for free. You make sure that everybody's healthy. And you make sure that everybody has a roof over their head and they're fed. And then you create incentives for them to succeed with those tools. It's basically you're giving them all the tools they need to succeed and saying that you can. Not that you can't. You want to be an artist? Be an artist. You want yeah. to be a writer? Be a writer. You, you want to be a scientist? Be a scientist. Yeah. Write your story. We are giving you the tools so that you can write your own story. Yeah. You're not ha it's not man against society anymore. It's man against self because we're giving you the tools. Yeah, we're not fighting against it. We're letting it happen. That's a big thing. 
Some people like to file papers. For some people, that's the perfect job. Some people like being the garbage guy. Some people take great pride in recycling. Some people also, want to teach people how to sail. Yeah. Some so, people you know, there's want to teach a people job to enjoy everything. scuba. Yeah, there's a job for everyone. There are career niches everywhere. Some people are policy wonks. Some people love yeah. the law. Yeah, absolutely. They're, and the thing is, there's still going to be <clears throat> economic drives for those jobs. You know Warren Buffett? You yeah. know, of, of Berkshire Hathaway? He, uh, he sent all of his kids to public school. He lives in a modest house, still in a modest house. And for decades, he would drive to a small little office in, I think it's in Oklahoma. Uh, and he'd, he'd drive there in a, in a modest car. Didn't do it to get rich. He did it because he loved the numbers. That was what he wanted to do. That's why he made so much goddamn money. <laughs> because he was happy doing the work. And that is probably one of his best secrets. Well, that's the secret to success. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Is do what you love. Yeah. I mean, I, I want to go back to school to pursue economics. Yeah. That's and why I'm so much on this UBI thing, because yeah. I see it as a mathematical solution to not just a math problem. This is, a, is something that solves a political problem, an ethical problem, an emotional problem. Mm hmm it is in some ways a silver bullet. Yeah. But as you brought up, there there is a trinity here, a holy trinity, if you will, Yeah. that needs to be put in place. My question to you, good sir, is what do you think will happen first? Uh, I think healthcare. At this point, okay. I think healthcare is going to happen first. Uh, because that, there's, the there's definitely an impetus there. It's, uh, it seems to be the right time. We've, there is a societal push for it because people, everyone, can agree that you just want to be healthy. You do not want to have to answer the question, your money or your life. This is a bad thing. We don't want that. We want to be taken care of. And we all have a bad story to tell about health care, don't we? Yeah. I don't know anybody that has no bad stories to tell either about their mother their father their brother their sister themselves their kids anybody they've got a story that is close to them one degree of separation and it's bad and that does not speak well of the system that we have had for so long the system that we have now was built out of <laughs> out of a haphazard union regulation trying to get people incentives to work there. That's where health insurance came in, as an incentive to stay at the company. Yeah. And then it burgeoned out, and it became its own thing, and it became a snake that eats itself, you know, constantly. It's, it's an ugly business, and it is a business. And business... Yes is there to make money, not to make you healthy. So if you want to be healthy, that has to be the primary goal, regardless of cost. And the only institution that can handle that is government that isn't in it to make a profit. It's a simple argument, and I think it will win. But it takes time to do that. <clears throat> and even in countries that have a universal health care... So many of them don't have a universal education, a no. free education system. So I think that that would then be the second pillar that would happen. And only after those two are available would a universal basic income 
become completely logical. And, it poss- and, the, and possible. Because you have the to have those two conclusion. first. Yeah. Because by that point, technology... Because, I mean, really, we're... In the United States, at least, we're talking this is going to happen over the course of maybe another 20 years. I mean, just the way it's going, though we did have some some great advances, still, 20 years is not that much in in the grand scheme of a four-year term of a president or an eight-year term of a good president. You know, Obama got, got eight years in there. And whether or not you think that he did a good job or a bad job, he did manage to push health care forward to the point where it's a really sticky wicket and has become a third rail of politics. You touch it yeah. at your own peril. And that's where it is today. And Again, part and of the reason because the of H- that, yeah. HCA <clears throat> failed was the threats to Medicare. Yeah, partially. Partially that, and it's it's just become so divisive. Some people just want it want it gone so bad that they just they they see red every time they think about it, and others are like, you know, I I don't think we really should do that because it's going to have some consequences and people are going to die. People are it's going to hurt a lot of people, you know, because then you start the ethics has crept in to it, and it's actually it's really amazing to see that finally the ethics are actually starting to approach. A parody with hate <laughs> on on this subject. So it's I have hope that that a a universal health care in the United States would happen within twenty years. It it's going to be a a difficult road, but I don't think that the Republicans are going to be able to get rid of it. It's going to have to change. It may end up being a Trump care kind of thing, but I think that it's going to fall so flat on its face that the only thing they could do is expand Medicare to help. Again, the the states were fining them on on the Medicare thing. The states that actually expanded Medicare were fighting them. Uh, yeah, and you also have the AARP, which yeah. which is the other, which is part of the reason why the moderate Republicans were going like, no, we can't do this. It, it, it yeah. the, the the Freedom Caucus be damned. It wasn't really them that decided. It was the moderate Republicans who went. I want to stay in office, and the yeah. ARP came out against this, and that's my voting base. Yeah, and a reminder for those at home: the the Freedom Caucus is just the rebranded Tea Party. Yeah, I'm not sure when that happened. When when did they just go from being the Tea Party to being the Freedom Caucus? Was that just the Freedom, a, came freedom Caucus with, came about? Came um, Trump, I believe, in Obama's fifth year. Mm. So uh, slowly, it just absorbed the entirety of the of what was the, the Tea Party. Well, it was. I remember the Cokes helped I don't hear form anything the, about tea, the tea, por- tea Party and helped fund that drive, and they're the ones that are the purse strings behind the Freedom Caucus. So it was just a rebranding. Well, I think that that uh, this that is going to conclude our our current conversation on the universal basic income. So <laughs> let me uh, pull up a little bit of uh, music here. And oh gosh, I lost it. Nope, there it is. Ah, uh, and that means that we're done. So, <clears throat> if you've enjoyed what we've done here today and you'd like to help us out, there are a few ways. You can donate to our universal basic income at patreon.com slash Radio and get early access to full show content. You can make the algorithm work for us by reviewing us on iTunes to boost our ranking. Use your words, tell somebody about us, and of course, engage us. Send us a message on the social media and the electronic mails at Podcast at gmail.com. Or if you're more talkative sort, we've got a phone number, 470-222-ORLY, that's 6759. It's always ready to take your call or text. And if you don't like what we've done here this evening, you can contact the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255. Available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The Lifeline provides free and confidential support for people in distress, prevention, and crisis resources for you and your loved ones, and best practices for professionals. 
Thank you for choosing to waste your valuable time on us. This has been O'Reilly Radio, part of the Random Acts Company. This work licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 United States license, including the music Rocket and Pemgea, created by Kevin McLeod of Incomptech.com. Thanks, everybody. We'll talk to you soon.